I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I had the question, what do I recommend for people who are moving to Nicaragua? Probably retirees, but this could have to do with anyone who is moving into the country. How do I recommend that they manage their money? Assuming they're coming from a country where they have bank accounts and a history of having money and resources and stuff. What do you do to move your money in or balance it or access that money? Or just how do you manage those things? And they additionally asked a little bit about what I recommend for handling healthcare here and abroad. So we're going to get to that right after the bump. Happy Monday morning, everybody. Yeah, so here in Nicaragua, a lot of people move in, especially retirees, but but honestly, this could be anybody. And there's a there's often a very big question of how do you handle your money? Because do you get a bank account in Nicaragua? Do you move all your money in? Do you bring it all with you in cash? What do you do? Now, there's a lot of things you can do. You have a lot of flexibility. And a lot of people ask, like, if I'm if I'm coming to Nicaragua as a tourist, as a as a resident, a different things. Under what conditions can I have a bank account? And the simple answer is you can basically always have a bank account. I would say that I don't believe there's a process for getting a bank account if you are abroad and not here at all. Unlike, uh, say, buying a house, which you can totally do without ever visiting the country. Maybe it's possible, but that would be extremely difficult. Here, banks assume that you're going to have to present yourself in person in order to open an account. Uh, and so I don't know that you'd be able to work around that. Maybe, maybe if you gave someone power of attorney. But... I don't think anyone's looking to do that. If you are here in country, even as a tourist, and we talk about this a bit, even if you plan to live here for the rest of your life, you're going to start as a tourist for a minimum of six months, probably 18 months, possibly a few years. Okay. As a tourist, can you open a bank account? Yes, it is legal to open a bank account, and at least some of the banks will allow you to. So we know people who have come here, they're just tourists, they are not yet residents. Uh, maybe they never plan to become residents, I don't know, and they do have bank accounts. Other people definitely are here as residents and don't have bank accounts. Both happen, but that means that basically bank accounts are open to everyone. Once you are a resident, and when you become a resident, you receive a national ID card known as a cedula. That document is sometimes required by the banks. So once you're a resident, every bank will allow you to have an account, whereas as a tourist, only some of the banks will allow based on their internal processes and procedures and, and rules. If you want to have a bank account, you basically can open one as soon as you arrive in the country, even just as a tourist checking the place out. It will take normally a week or two. You'll have to do a lot of appearing at the bank, a lot of waiting in lines. It is not a simple process. It's not complicated, but it, it, it just takes a lot of work. Um, and a lot of people opt not to do it. Now, the question really becomes, why would you want a bank account in Nicaragua or anywhere that you're moving to when you have uh, very simple financial options? Well, some of the questions will start with, where are you coming from? If you're coming from a place where you don't have a bank account, everything you have is cash, you don't have any good banking, you don't have good connections to Nicaragua, you may want to have a bank account in Nicaragua to deal with those problems. So let's start with those. If you're coming from a country, not the U.S., not Canada, probably nowhere in Europe. Um, generally, you're coming from some very uh, similar small country that is very poor and does not have a strong banking infrastructure and it doesn't have any way to transfer funds or work directly with banks in Nicaragua. If that applies to you, then probably the rest of this video will not apply to you. Uh, and you probably do want to, if you are certain you're going to be living in Nicaragua long term, you want to take the one-time uh, pain and move all of your money in and have access to it. Otherwise, when you're living in Nicaragua, maybe you can't even get to your money. But if you need to be able to spend some of your money somewhere else, you're going to have to balance those things. Almost no one, and possibly actually no one, will have that apply to them. For the majority of you who are not Nicaraguans, this obviously doesn't apply to those who are actually Nicaraguan and, and live here already, um, you're probably coming from a place with a really strong banking infrastructure and is able to move money in and out of Nicaragua essentially transparently. So US, Canada, England, the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, even places like China, Japan, all those places, you're all gonna be fine. South Africa, absolutely no issues. So if you're coming from a place like that, when you get to Nicaragua, you may or may not want to have a bank account. And a lot of this comes down to personal preference of how you want to work and how you want to do things. But do you need one? No. Simple answer is no. You do not need a bank account here. I do not have a bank account here. The majority of people I know do not have bank accounts here. 
Could they be beneficial? Absolutely. Having a bank account here could be useful for any number of things. It could be useful for uh, making some of your payments, like you want to pay your electric or your, uh, your, your bill for your internet provider or something like that. They may take a direct deposit from uh, your bank and allow you to just go online. And I know some people who do this, right? You go into your banking app on your phone and you pay your bills, just like you would in the United States or whatever. Uh, and that could be super simple. And so that may be something that is empowered by having an account at the right bank that allows you to do that. Or in some cases, having the right kind of bank card here, I believe with Banpro, can give you discounts at certain restaurants on Thursdays. And they can be pretty hefty discounts. And so it might be worth having a bank account just because you always want to go out to eat on a Thursday and leverage those discounts. It especially works well if you live in Managua, where they tend to have a lot of places that, that honor that system. Those kinds of things can be really handy. You can also find uh, that some of the, the banks have, have large deployment of their payment systems or their ATMs throughout the country, and you want to be able to use those at no charge. And so by having an account with that particular bank may give you a little bit more ease of payment or whatever where you're not paying any overhead. However, in many of those cases, I would say if they're willing to take credit cards, you really should think about having a credit card that has a lot of uh, benefits to it, one that has a lot of like insurance, no foreign transactions, fees, pays you uh, cash back or travel points or something, depending on you and how you, uh, you know, vacation or travel or shop or whatever it is you do, your needs will be different. So I can't recommend a specific card or a specific type of card for you. But in general, you want to have that kind of credit card. And anytime you would be paying in those ways, you want to use those rather than a local card. Even unless the local cards also come with those benefits, and I've not seen any that do that. So for me, uh, I don't have a bank account here, but I do have an American Express that gives me a lot of travel benefits. I have a World MasterCard that gives me different benefits. I have a, a very uh, special travel uh, Visa card that gives me loads of travel benefits. And I plan to, at some point in the future, get a travel Discover card as well. Have all four and use one of those every time we go out. We have one that we use almost all the time, but the others, if we're like, oh, we're gonna stay at a hotel, we Need points for that or we're gonna fly we need points for that we you know try to carefully balance our spending to spread it out and get the maximum benefit from all of our cards and use the ones that give us the most points or, or money back or benefits at any given moment uh, but with that we're getting so much value out of every time we spend we wouldn't want to use a local card because using our foreign cards uh, actually saves us money it's better than paying nothing we actually get paid just a little bit to use those cards that's a big benefit as a foreigner living in Nicaragua there is essentially nothing where you need a bank account and very few things that would benefit in some way from it. It may be convenient for little things like I mentioned, but in general, all of those things, with rare exception, are pretty easy to handle some other way. Now, if you're running a business here, you're an investor and you're in a different category, you're not just here to retire or just here to live, you're actually here to invest and run a business in the country, obviously you're going to need a bank account. But that would be your business with a bank account, not you personally. Even in those situations, you personally may not want a bank account and what your business does, that's a, that's a separate discussion. Now you're talking about how to run a business in a foreign country, and, and that's unrelated to this discussion. So it, when I say you don't want a bank account, I mean you don't want a bank account, not that some entity you create here in Nicaragua that doesn't exist somewhere else doesn't need a bank account somewhere. Of course it would. We're assuming you, as someone moving into Nicaragua, at least have had bank accounts in your home country previously. If not, then you probably should get one. They're very handy things to have. Uh, and so uh, generally, Generally, you have no actual need for a bank account. And this is why so many people don't bother to get it. It's a big effort to get, and you may never use it. The idea that you would transfer all your money into Nicaragua when you move here, outside of the original exception that I said, basically makes no sense for a number of reasons. One is you pay a huge penalty up front when you move your money in. Second is you shouldn't have all of your holdings in currency sitting in a bank account. That's not generally wise. You want to keep any money that you're not actively spending in an investment account of some sort. This is just a general rule. Make sure you're gaining real interest that beats inflation, at least the majority of the time, so that you're not losing money by holding it. Of course, you need a small amount of liquidity in a bank account so that you can pay your bills and do whatever, but you don't want to be moving massive amounts of cash around in currency holdings. It just doesn't make sense, regardless of what the Bitcoin people want to sell you on. Uh, they need to make it sound really attractive so that they can get you to buy the Bitcoins they paid too much for, right? They're desperate to, to make a quick buck off of you. That's why they promote it. But it doesn't actually make sense to hold a currency the fundamentally, the definition of a currency includes a thing that you would never want to hold, right? It's a transaction instrument. So 
And some people actually try to say that Bitcoin isn't a transaction instrument. That would make it not a currency, right? So that's very silly. Then you definitely don't want it. It's just monopoly money. Right? It's not a real thing. It is a real thing, but it's a currency. It's meant for transactions. Uh, so the, the idea is really the thing that makes sense for essentially everyone. There's going to be an exception, but they're going to be really, really rare. Is you want to keep your money invested in whatever you have it invested in elsewhere, whether it's 401ks, Roth IRAs, just your own, you know, investment accounts, some stock portfolio, a mutual fund, gold, whatever it is you're using to protect yourself against inflation. Gold's not very good for that. It's a commodity, not a, not a, it doesn't generate value. So it's not going to actually beat inflation over time. It can't, no matter what anyone try, again, no matter how much people who have gold are trying to sell you on more gold, they're just trying to get their prices up so they can they can unload what they have. Uh, it, it just it's going to match inflation essentially, right? Because it's a commodity. It, it doesn't it doesn't have the ability to actually gain value. Unlike a business, a business investment actually gains value over time. So that's why those are important. They generate more value, and so you, they actually become more valuable. Unlike static things that just may hold their value, like real estate and gold, but they don't actually gain things on average over time. They fluctuate. So there are ways to trade and make money, but you don't invest to make money. That's the difference. Uh, having your money, you want your money protected, and then you want to use your foreign banks generally to do the manipulation of your money. And the reason for this, and this is a universal rule, has nothing to do with Nicaragua, has nothing to do with the U.S. Pick your country, and there may be an exception because of local corruption or some weird thing going on in whatever country you're coming from, and maybe you got to get your money out of there because there's a problem accepting that. You generally want your money to be generated through investments in whatever place you're able to invest, and then that money to pay its dividends or whatever into a bank in that country. Because that is how you have a frictionless transaction. You need to be able to manipulate the money where it is generated, and you don't want to shift that money around unless you're prepared to spend it for a number of reasons. One, there is often a tax penalty or a fee penalty when you move things between regions. So you don't want to do that unnecessarily. Sometimes you need to, and that's fine. You want to move money only when it makes sense to move money. So if it's at rest, assume it should stay at rest. If it's invested, it should definitely stay invested. By doing that, you're only going to move money when it makes sense to move. You have time to look for low-cost transactions. You have time to accumulate transactions. So instead of moving a little bits of money, say $500 here, $500 there, maybe you save it up and you move $5,000 when you need to do it. That'll generally lower your transaction fees and allow you to have more of your own money, not to mention more time that it can stay in investments or in interest bearing accounts. So you can have this cumulative effect of saving more and more money by not moving it around unnecessarily. The, the willy nilly movement of money is a great way to lose value. It just it increases so much risk and risk brings us to the biggest point is you don't know what's going to happen in the future and you have your lowest risk. Again, with rare exception, you would know if you're in a country, if you're from a war torn country and the banking infrastructure could collapse or something. Okay different story. But if you're in the US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, all these places, those places are stable, right? They may have a lot of problems, but their their econo their economies are stable. Their banking infrastructure is stable. And your money being there is not at any particular risk by the nature of it being there. And and before someone says inflation, that doesn't apply to money that's invested. That applies to, again, holding money where you, the way you shouldn't. You have to really screw up how you're holding money for holding money to be affected by inflation. So that shouldn't be a worry in the first place. Uh, and then by holding it there, what if, right, what if anything, no matter what's going to happen, what if you don't have anything changed and your plans stay that you're going to stay in Nicaragua and your long-term plan remains your long-term plan and there's never a variation. Great. By holding the money in your home country and shifting it in only as needed, you have maximized the benefits for you living in Nicaragua. Had you shifted it all into Nicaragua earlier, it may have been a trivial penalty and you may not even notice the difference, but it's not a benefit to shift that money early. It's only a really, really minor penalty in some cases, but it could be a large penalty depending. So why do it, right? But what if 
anything else happens? What if you decide not to stay in Nicaragua? If, what if you can't stay in Nicaragua? What if your life situation changes and you meet someone and you get married and you move off to another country? What if you decide that the weather in Nicaragua is not something that works for you and you have to move someplace cooler? What if, what if, what if? It doesn't matter why. An unlimited number of what ifs could make you decide to move to another country. Maybe you have a business opportunity, you meet someone and they're like, I've got this investment in Ecuador you got to come do. And you're like, that's okay, that's what I want to do. I'm going to I'm gonna get into a wedding photography business in Ecuador. I, I found my passion late in life. Now we're doing this. It's going to be great, right? Whatever. You move to that new country. Now you got to move your money again. Had you kept your money in the United States or Canada or wherever originally, now it would still be in the place ready for you to access and use from wherever. And wherever you move to, if you need to pull it out, you can. Moving money from Nicaragua to any random place, yes, in general, you could do that as well. It's not like you will lose your money, but you've already paid a penalty to move it into Nicaragua. You've moved it presumably from a place where it's very easy to do international transactions to one that's relatively hard. You've moved into another jurisdiction, so there's multiple opportunities for taxation or for uh, money laundering rules to kick in or any number of complications that you don't need to have uh, uh, triggered and you don't know what the other country is going to do as far as allowing money to move in. What if they don't allow you to move money in from Nicaragua or don't have access to Nicaraguan banking, but they do to the U.S.? And you say, well, what if it's the other way around? But if it's the other way around, you can at the last minute move your money into Nicaragua and move it on. You, you don't give up any options by waiting and holding your money in the original country. You are maintaining those options. So you're doing in every step risk abatement by keeping the money where it is. This is a general rule for business, and it's just a lot of business rules apply to personal life because they're not really business rules as much as just common sense and risk management rules. And I come from a Wall Street background, so we're used to doing this for everything. And one of the things we say in IT, and I'll just give a completely random example, but it's a useful one for a lot of people. Often when people are buying computers, they will say things like, well, I want to buy a computer that's going to last me 10 years. And this is absolutely something that should never leave your mouth. It makes no sense. It would make sense if you were doing something like, well, I'm going to be living on the International Space Station for 10 years. I'm going to be living in a submarine for 10 years. I'm moving to Antarctica for 10 years. And there is absolutely no possibility of buying something else. And so I have to have this one thing work for a decade. It's my only way to have a computer. So it's got, okay, that is a very different discussion that applies to literally no one. In the real world, when you're buying a computer, you have the option of buying another computer. Well, one of the things that IT professionals know and that Everyone should know if they stop and think about it a little bit, and this applies to everything in life. There's no computer knowledge with this. There's no technical, there's no business. This is just basic adulting. It should be obvious that if you're buying something that lasts 10 years and that thing costs significantly more than the thing, so a computer that's gonna be good, like for good for video gaming for 10 years, is going to cost well more than double what a computer that's good for gaming now is. And with computers specifically, it's easy to project that through all of history this has been true. It is certainly going to remain true for the indefinite future. That if we waited five years, we can buy a computer that is faster than what we... Uh, let's just put real numbers on it. Let's say we want to get an extreme gaming computer today. It's going to cost us maybe $3,000. And that'll still play games for about 10 years, we think. Right? Really good chance of it. First of all, no one knows that it'll last for 10 years. But we think it will. And then we... Compare that to buying a $1,000 gaming machine that we could use today, and it would work pretty well. We barely notice a difference in high-end games today, but in five years, yes, the one that was 3,000 will just keep on chugging, and the one that was 1,000 will be showing its age a little bit, and you'll want to upgrade it. Okay, so in five years, we buy another $1,000 computer. Well, we expect that that $1,000 computer in five years will be faster than the $3,000 computer today. So today, we get a computer that's nearly as good, but in five years, we get one that's even better. Now we have two computers. Our first one didn't evaporate because we bought the second one. It's just not so good, but that's additional value. Now we've spent $2,000 instead of $3,000. We have two computers instead of one, and our faster computer is faster than the one computer, and our slower one is slower, but we have two. So we have so much more functionality and we have better high-end performance and we spent less money. And at the end of 10 years, we will be a thousand dollars ahead. Actually, it's more than that because of the time value of money. We'll be much closer to being like $1,200 ahead on total money spent. Uh, and if you don't know time value of money, just go look that up. Like, It'll help you with some calculations. It's impossible to do it exact, but you can project one way or another spending later saves you money right? Because you can always take that money and invest it and wait five years. And then the interest is still there helping you out over time. So 
at the end of 10 years, you are financially way ahead and you're technologically way ahead. But there's other factors. What if in five years you decide you don't want to keep video gaming or you decide that you don't need a new computer uh, to get the advantages? Like, you're, oh, that $1,000 computer? They didn't advance that much. My $1,000 one is going to last just like the $3,000 one was. Or maybe it'll last the six or seven or eight years. You don't know. Right? So you've protected yourself against the unknown. What if you decide you don't want to play video games anymore? Oh, it was a hobby I had. No new good games that I'm passionate about have come out. I don't want to put more money into this. Okay, I'm done with this. Or I get really busy. Or what if something happens to you and you can't play? Maybe you get really busy with work or some accident happens. Whatever has happened, the unknown is protected by holding off that investment. The same kind of thing applies here. There's so much protection by not moving your money unnecessarily that Whatever unknowns you haven't prepared for are protecting you by keeping the money where it is as long as you can and only moving it when you need to or roughly when you need to. You can move it a little bit like, oh, I need it next month. I'm going to move it now. Yeah, fine. But don't just take your life fortune and shift it around because you think you've come up with a permanent plan and you think that that permanent plan involves keeping all that money there because that's another part of this potential mistake. What if you move, let's just say you have a million dollars, it's your, it's your lifetime savings, you move all of it into Nicaragua. Now you've got a million dollars in Nicaragua, you don't plan on doing anything outside of Nicaragua, why have banks, why even deal with anything else? All you want to do is be in Nicaragua. Hey, great, I totally understand that mentality. But let's say you're good, okay, great, you've got a million dollars, you decide to buy a house in Nicaragua. Oh, awesome, I'm going to stay here, this is my place, let's go buy a house. Okay. Maybe that house is going to be here in Nicaragua and you're going to find it and it's going to be like cash. He's going to pay the people out of your million dollars and you've got a house. Fine. Then things worked out just fine. But what if they say, oh, well, actually the owner of this house lives in Canada and they would like to do the transaction in North America. And you say, oh, but I already moved my money into Nicaragua and took a very tiny but penalty to do so. I paid to move that money in. Now it's all in Nicaragua. And they're like, sorry, pay to move it back out again. And you're like, ah, because you did an unnecessary transaction, you're at potential risk to have to do yet another unnecessary transaction. If you kept the money in the United States all along, and they then said, or in Canada or wherever, and then they said, oh, we want to do it in North America, you'd say, great, my money's already there, I never moved it, so that worked out. If they say, I want to do it in Nicaragua, which is more likely, but both are pretty likely, then you would say, oh, well, I didn't move it ahead of time, but I'm not moving it extra. There's no penalty for having not moved it early. Now I'll just move it as I need it. And it'll be the same penalty that I would have paid had I moved it early. So it's all a wash. So by keeping it where it originated, you've minimized your risk for day-to-day -day transactions, even if you're staying in Nicaragua forever and never setting foot anywhere else again, never want to do a transaction anywhere else again, it still continues to lower your risk because those are real things that could come up and do almost everyone we know as expats who doesn't any amount of buying and selling homes eventually has some transactions that happen in North America that is super common here. And so don't put yourself at risk by shifting your money out so that you have to shift it back in. And of course, if you are uh, being scrutinized for taxes or money laundering or anything like that, having to shift money into the country is going to cause a really big observation of your funds and shifting it back out is going to really trigger a lot of uh, inspection of your funds. That doesn't mean you can't do it. It doesn't mean you're in trouble. It just means that there's going to be a lot closer eyes on you and they're going to be really asking for a lot of paperwork and scrutinizing everything you do to make sure that it's all above board because there is a lot of money laundering that goes on or is attempted, especially in international transfers. So you don't want to set yourself up for problems. Do everything you can to minimize risk. Keep things as simple as possible. Keep your funds where they originate, wherever that is, as long as you can, and only shift them to wherever you're going to spend them within a reasonable amount of time before you're going to spend them. Now you're wondering, how do I shift my money in? Let's say I do have some transactions. You're listening to me. You're keeping the money in North America, but, but, you're going to buy a house. It needs to be in Nicaragua. It needs to be in cash. You have a number of options, right? You can do a transfer directly to the bank account of someone you're paying. You may never need to have that money in Nicaragua at all. So that could be really simple. And that's a great case where it's a good thing you didn't move it in ahead of time. It wouldn't have done you any good. Uh, you may want to put it into your own bank account. You've opened a bank account. You have the ability to take transfers here. You just do bank to bank transfer and it comes into your bank. And then you're in a great shape. You can move in however much you want to have operating for in Nicaragua and just put it directly into your bank account. Account. That's 
absolutely fine. For a lot of us who don't have bank accounts, we have another option that works really well. ATMs here in Nicaragua will pull money directly from our banks in the United States. So I can go to the ATM anytime and pull out my operating money for the day or the week or the month whatever. And so by doing that, we actually have really easy access. Now, if we're going to say buy a house or buy a car here, that could be a problem. Honestly, buying a car here, you might go through an ATM anyway. It's really not that bad as long as you have a little bit of time to prepare. But if you're buying a house, that would be absurd. Uh, it would take months at maxing out every every ATM you could find to try to uh, try to get enough money to do a, a house or a business purchase. Uh, but if you are going to do that, then you'll do some kind of transfer or whatever. But for most of life, because remember, for almost all people who are living in Nicaragua from abroad, the cost of living is so low. And this would seem crazy in the United States that you could live completely out of uh, ATM transfers, um, normally withdrawals, uh, because you know if you're paying your rent, you'd be like, well, that's multiple ATM withdrawals. It's like this really big thing, and it's super costly, and and just everything in life just adds up. It's way too much money to be taking out of an ATM. But here in Nicaragua, nearly everything is a fraction of the cost, and so when you combine how much you spend from in in cash, and you can use a credit card, which I recommend for a lot of transactions, like going out to eat whenever possible. Uh, you put that together, you actually don't necessarily need to take that much out of an ATM and you can easily operate out of that amount of budget per month. So, you know, it's it's not uncommon for people to operate in a sub thousand dollar budget monthly up to several thousand, but not getting into crazy numbers. And all of that, considering we can pull eight hundred dollars per transaction out of the ATMs. Well, at eight hundred dollars per day, that is an outrageous amount of potential money. That's twenty four thousand dollars a month that you could be working with for spending. And that's that's to the point with that, you could almost buy houses out of that cash. And so you don't generally need to do that. A lot of us only hit the ATM once or twice a month and use that for everything that isn't just credit card out for dinner. If you're doing Pedita's job to order food, I'd use credit card because then you don't have to deal with cash, whatever. It makes life really easy. Those little things offset that cash a little bit. You don't have to hit the ATM quite as often. But you put that all together and you often have zero need literally zero need to ever bring in large amounts of money all at once. The ATM actually does provide you enough at a shot to make it completely reasonable and practical. So just to summarize, the basic answer is keep it simple. Keep your money wherever it originates as long as possible. Bring in only what you need for the foreseeable future. Work from a bank account here locally if you want, but only if you really see a reason to bother going through that effort. And think about just using ATMs and keep things as simple as possible. Remember, legally you're a tourist for a really long time, so using mechanisms that tourists normally use, like hitting an ATM when you need cash to get through a week or a month, is absolutely normal, absolutely acceptable, absolutely logical. It's a smart way to go, and tons of the happiest people here say the same thing. Oh, I just use the ATM. I don't. I never worry about bank accounts. I never worry about anything. I've got bank accounts in wherever I came from, and I just pull money out of my account and use it, and everything's there if I need to. If I want to buy something on Amazon, I don't have to move my money back to the States. I just buy it on Amazon. If I need to pay for a transaction here that's happening, I just do that like everything. And if I need a large sum of money, either I bring it in through the ATMs or I do a direct transfer to whoever needs it um, and pay them directly and it never has to pass through me. So my need for a bank account is zero. Totally understand if that's something you want or you have some, you know, particular bills or things that you need to do regularly and you think a bank account would make that easier for you, that's fine. But assume that your desire for a bank account is probably much higher than your need for a bank account. Maybe try coming down and working without one. Start in the absolute easiest thing. Leave all your money behind, pull what you need out of an ATM. Of course, bring a couple hundred dollars with you to get over the border and get started on your first couple days. But beyond that, we have ATMs everywhere. You can take out US currency or Cordoba, and you can do anything you need that way. So consider that that's at least a way to start. Give yourself months, maybe a year before you even think about, should I maybe get a bank account? And then with that amount of time, you'll see how easy the ATMs are. You'll see all the protections it gives you. You'll feel any annoyance or pain that you get from using the ATMs. Like maybe you live in a place where an ATM isn't close. That could swing things a little bit. Like when we lived on the beach, there's no ATM. So that's kind of annoying uh, to have to hit an ATM. But now that we live in the city. I can walk to ATMs and so it's not annoying at all. Uh, so that has shifted a lot of things. If you live in a small town somewhere and you're constantly trying to live out of cash and they do have a bank agent but they don't have an ATM, well maybe a bank account would make sense for you. Absolutely, that's that's a possibility. Uh, but gauge those things. Make it as simple as possible. Do as least overhead 
to get started as you possibly can and then make those decisions once you're well established and know exactly how your patterns are going to be affected by your decisions. Hopefully that answers that part of your question. The next part of the question is about Medicare. The question was asked, when coming to Nicaragua, should you just rely on the public and or private medical care systems that exist here in Nicaragua, or should Medicare or Medicaid be maintained in the United States, uh, or I would presume some other type of insurance uh, for different things. So this is a tough one, and it's extremely personal, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. There's money, there's your health, and then there's your risk aversion and your willingness to be flexible or your capability of being flexible. So it depends on a lot of things. For me personally, my family would never travel back to the United States for any kind of medical emergency. I don't have family in the United States that would be taking care of us in case of that. So I don't have any siblings or anything. So it's not like I would be like, oh no, I have this emergency. I'm moving out of Nicaragua. I'm moving to the United States. I'm now an invalid and someone's going to take care of me there. That would not be my process. Uh, if anything like that happened, I would need to stay here in Nicaragua and be taken care of here where it costs less. So for me and my family, like going back to the U.S. is completely not an option for anything, even though we do have insurance. So if we're in the United States, if something were to happen, we have insurance in the U.S. currently because we do travel there from time to time. And being in the U.S. even for two or three days without insurance is absolutely terrifying. If you have a heart attack there, you're in a car accident there, you could be left totally helpless, totally destitute, just because you pass through the country without health insurance for a couple days. So I'm very wary of, of doing that at all without insurance. So we do maintain that, but it's only for those days that we're in the United States. If something was to happen to us in Nicaragua, we would never ever let ourselves be taken back to the U.S. if we needed to leave Nicaragua. If we did need to leave Nicaragua, which could happen for a really major or specialty uh, event, um, normal things you can handle here. Here in Leon, we have a new hospital coming in and it's going to have an amazing oncology department, a cardiac unit. They're going to be able to do heart transplants right here in Leon. Now this is new, so people who are moving down, this is something to look forward to. The first facilities of this are opening in the next few weeks and they're going to be opening more buildings in a large campus here in the city over a period of time. But we have a lot that you're able to do here in country. For the moment, yes, we still need to go to Managua for certain things. Of course, if you have pre-existing doctors and, and stuff in other countries, you may keep using them to some degree. But a lot of emergencies, especially in treatments, can be done here in country or in the region. And the region is generally considered to be from roughly Mexico to Colombia because it is a it is a large healthcare region. You don't have to go north to the United States and you don't have to go south to say Argentina or Chile. Although you could, though they're not actually as far as it seems, but we have so much healthcare, uh, especially in Colombia, quite a bit in Mexico and a fair amount in El Salvador that are all affordable and expert. And so typically you're only using or wanting to use resources up north in the United States uh, or wherever you're coming from originally, if you're in the process of phasing over information or uh, phasing it out, or, you know, you have pre-existing information uh, that you need to do from there is very, very rare that you would choose to go there for a new situation. You would want to be located here. So having and maintaining healthcare in the United States really only makes sense if you're if you're visiting and you need to be covered while you're there absolutely um, and a lot of people have to visit right family or or whatever and so you're, you're going to be there from time to time so you got to have those things for that reason um, or if you have very specific uh, pre-existing issues and you have some resources up there that you need to continue using uh, and so you may want to maintain for that. But if you're making a move fully to Nicaragua, you don't have, you know, a doctor you need to keep uh, working with in the United States that is in some, some you know, Medicare uh, uh, system or whatever, then I think in most cases, and this is very subjective, so, so you really need to stop and evaluate your own needs. I don't want to give medical advice and have someone be like, but, the, but then this thing happened that, uh, that I don't know about, right? In the majority of cases, it is likely that you're going to want to reduce your spending in the United States as much as possible, take the money that you would have spent there and bank that here in Nicaragua or bank it somewhere with interest or whatever, but, but save it up so that should emergencies happen, which as we get older and we start talking about people who are dealing with Medicare and Medicaid situations are more likely to need medical care, that you have that money set aside and you're able to have complete financial independence, total control of your medical care and the option to go wherever that's needed. And hopefully that's right here in Nicaragua. But if it's not, if you need to go to Colombia, you need to go to El Salvador, maybe you need to go to Mexico, that you'll be able to do so 
and you have the cash to simply say, here's what I want done, here's where I want it done, here's who I want to do it, and here's you know how I want to be treated, with your cash in hand, everyone's here working for you right they're not they're not just doing what has to be done not that they won't but you being in control of your own healthcare is important and that's something you're not used to in the united states that's a huge amount of benefit and really important for quality healthcare you can't have quality healthcare where the hospital is just making decisions on your behalf based on what makes them money or what makes their insurance company money or what the government says to do. None of those things are good processes. Good healthcare is driven by a doctor and healthcare professionals who are honestly trying to do a good job for you and you having input as to what matters to you or what you can do or what you can live with, right? There's so many things that have to come from you. And so uh, this is a healthcare system that recognizes that. And this is a process by having the cash in hand and paying for what you need that you can guarantee that you have ultimate control of everything that's done, right? You really do get say, you don't wanna do a test, they're not gonna do a test. You want to do a test and you're like, I'm gonna pay for this test. They're gonna do it. They're not gonna turn you down and say, you're not gonna get a test. I'm not gonna sell this to you. Of course they are, right? Maybe you're not gonna get priority on a machine that has a waiting list and people who need it are gonna go first, but they're certainly going to allow you to buy the healthcare that makes sense for you because you have that power. So in general, you want to reduce your external spending, especially on things that will be essentially useless, right? You don't want uh, to have an American insurance system when you don't live in America and that the only way to use it is to be flown back. You will be incurring both incredibly high cost and in most cases, a very dramatically drop uh, in quality of hair, a, a, a dramatic drop in the quality of healthcare by going to the United States. Those are not things you want to have happen. You want higher quality healthcare with more control at lower cost. And so that's why you wanna be in this region, not necessarily in Nicaragua specifically, but within the region. And so if you are gonna be looking at healthcare, uh, healthcare insurance, which is reasonable, some people find it valuable, some people do not, then you should be looking at things that cover you where it makes sense, not just covers you in the United States, but covers you in Nicaragua, covers you if you need to go to Colombia, or Mexico or El Salvador, or whatever, that you have those options and that the insurance works with you and they're there to actually pay things. I'm not recommending any specific insurance or specific uh, or insurance in general, but it could easily make sense for you. We also have here in country, and at some point I'll do an episode where we break down some costs and features and just give you an idea of, of how it works. But there are um, things that are kind of like insurance with some of the facilities here, such as Vivian Pellis in Managua. They do have programs where you can pay for a small amount. It's like 30 or $60 per month and you get different levels of uh, discount and service and options when you use that hospital. And if you're going to be, you know, living in Managua or in an area where you have a Vivian Pellis clinic or you uh, just need to do a lot of procedures there, you may want to pay in and have a discount so that just everything costs less in the future. Those things can be completely reasonable and you just need to evaluate based on your own needs. And the last thing you wanna do is get into a, a system like that and then decide you're gonna spend a huge amount of your time outside of the country and maybe you're living in Colombia half the time well, then that kind of system may not make sense. And if you're living out in Madagalpa, it may not make sense. But you're living in Managua right next to that hospital, it may be the most obvious thing in the world. So again, it's very much a private evaluation, but those things do exist and would generally be a much better use of your funds than paying into Medicare in the United States, which it would be unlikely that you would ever have a way to use. The cost of using something, even though you have coverage, would generally be massively greater than the cost of getting better healthcare somewhere else without any coverage. And that's one of the most important numbers, is generally the, the co-pays, the overages, the things that insurance doesn't cover in the United States is generally higher than just paying out of pocket somewhere else. So that isn't the fear of not having insurance is totally different because you, you aren't being covered. In the United States, the insurance rarely covers a, an extreme amount of things. The insurance raises the price so that it appears like it's covering a lot of things, but in reality, it's not. When you compare it to the actual price of healthcare in the rest of the world, you realize that it's actually a farce in most cases and isn't actually providing the coverage that they claim, and you would be better serve financially to be without coverage in a total emergency somewhere else. You would still pay less, still get better healthcare. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at the link down below or on the screen, buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, like, subscribe, tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. 
And with these four videos up on the screen, you could do me a great favor by just clicking on one, let it play, watch it if you can. If not, just let it play in the background. Every little view helps a lot with the channel.